Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much again for turning up today, and apologies, this is your third presentation whereby we're talking at you, so I hope you can continue to endure for a little while longer. Um, obviously, as Anna has just said, this is a communication event and it's a rare opportunity for us to understand how we can enable and facilitate your contribution to our policy development process. So we're, uh, we're quite excited about the opportunity it's provided us as well. I'm just going to give an overview of basically some of the rationale behind our green papers and also what the, the broader context is um, in relation to quality assurance. Uh, so as existing providers and stakeholders that are familiar with uh, QQI are the legacy agencies, you will be familiar with the full range of quality assurance services. Um, I'm not going to go into those in detail, but maybe just to point out the, some of the uh, themes underpinning today's presentations are to try and articulate to yourselves the connectivity between quality assurance and qualification. So I hope that message manages to uh, communicate itself across to you. So we have um, we've presented a range of green papers, okay, and we have basically their kind of outline issues and options. And um, again, as I've said, they they indicate the connections and the cross references, which is why it's such a comprehensive uh, policy development process. Um, we've also indicated in these green papers the transitional arrangements. So these are the arrangements uh, that we have established at present to ensure that business continuity is ongoing. We've indicated the prescribed legal obligations um, as set out in the 2012 Act and also some possible options and, and ways to move forward and we've, we've asked some questions and again we're looking for your contribution, we're looking for your feedback today and whatever uh, feedback you can give us so it's really your counsel. As Porik mentioned we have all of our professional staff, well most of them with us today they have a significant amount of experience between them across the four agencies. Uh, as we speak, they're providing business continuity to an awful lot of providers that are still continuing to seek access to awards, which are now QQI awards, as Brian has said. And again, um, the diversity of the group alone that we have here today is, is, uh, is significant. So the Green Papers presented on provider access to accreditation um, outlines the transitional positions and that's that's just one example of as you recognize yourself in the transitional uh, the transition arrangements set out there okay sorry i keep going backwards here so just to have a, again a little bit of rationale regarding um the qa context so we have spent quite a time considering the inherited position the position that we have inherited from the four agencies and other types of provision, the English language training. So what I mean by that is we're looking at the policies, we're looking at procedures, that we've inverted guidelines, the processes that have been established for all of you and engagement with all of you, uh, those processes in action, the implementation of all of those, the structures in place underpinning and supporting those, and literally right down to the engagements and interactions, and also the dialogue. And we've looked at some of the, uh, the expectations that we I suppose we're anticipating on your behalf and on behalf of uh, other stakeholders. So again, we're looking at the direct and indirect contributions to the system of qualifications underpinned by quality assurance. And as Brian has just articulated there, the different routes to the national framework of qualifications is part of that. It's part of the holistic, coherent approach again that I've mentioned already. So what are we looking at? We're looking at similarities, we're looking at overlaps, and we're looking at gaps. Gaps that exist with regard to those prescribed legal obligations. We have been granted the ability to transfer our existing QA arrangements uh, with us under the transitional section within the legislation, and I've already mentioned that. But this is a holding position, so we are obliged to move on as QQI. The green paper on re-engagement with legacy providers kind of articulates this concept as well. So that's paper 414. No need to look at it now, obviously. We've also considered quite a number of the expectations, and, and Brian's very unreadable slide is, is interesting, again, from that perspective, because there are so many expectations on this body, as Quality and Qualifications Ireland, we could actually write a book about it. Not all of them are realistic. But I think 
One of the uh, common themes is a new robust sustainable quality assurance arrangements to underpin the qualifications. Again, connecting the two and highlighting the, uh, the coherence. Okay, so maybe just to, to articulate the fact that uh, having inherited quality assurance systems under the legacy agencies, uh, we've also, I suppose, we need to give uh, acknowledgement to the fact that everybody has been busy, nobody has been idle, providers engaging with agencies, they have made significant investments in quality and quality systems and quality assurance. Some of those providers have engaged with the legacy agencies to actually test the effectiveness of those systems in place. And that's actually important. Uh, that's a very public context when you're engaging with an agency to test the effectiveness of your system and the results of that are published. They're open, it's a public arena with a view to improving those systems. So this brings challenges for the existing QA system for those that are perhaps on their third or fourth iteration of quality assurance and they're looking to see how quality assurance can actually sustain them in this much more complex society and the changing landscape. But it also highlights those as well that may not have had the opportunity or just have not engaged to the point where they're looking at the effectiveness of their systems. And again, this provides another challenge to the agency and to the providers. And it also highlights a few interesting concepts emerging from our own uh, papers and the issues that we have highlighted. So some of those significant issues, we've, we've looked at coherence and the holistic approach and our consideration of the totality of our arrangements and engagements with providers and all the other stakeholders. Uh, we've articulated the requirements of the act and we've looked at that. But just looking at the diversity of providers and the diversity of their legal status. Now, that's, that's an interesting concept and we'll move on to that now. We also have something to present in terms of how we're going to cope with that or how we see that articulating itself with more clarity in the future. And we'll discuss that in a minute. That's the life cycle of provider engagements. But maybe just to have a look at the category of, of uh, legacy providers as we call them. So forgive the terminology here, it's a little bit blunt, but we are actually trying to relate it back to the legislative requirements so people can recognize their position and institutions can see where, where they're at at the moment. So the diversity of providers and engagements with providers is linked to the standing and status of these providers. So for example, what we have here on this diagram which is also set out in that paper on re-engagement with legacy providers, is a very broad articulation of providers that are obliged to engage with QQI, the large public institutions that by right must come to QQI for recognition and other purposes, and also those that are presenting to QQI on a voluntary basis. So those seeking access to QQI awards are the, the awards of the former legacy bodies as we know them. Diversity is to be welcomed. There's, there's absolutely no problem with having a diverse range of providers and our experience to date with diversity is actually quite positive. It challenges the effectiveness of policy. Make sure it has to make sure that policy is enduring, it's sustainable, it's fit for purpose and it evolves to capture the circumstances as required while maintaining consistency and standards. However, diversity when linked to the capacity of a provider and the capacity of a provider to engage and re-engage and sustain that periodic or annual engagement is a little bit more challenging in a concept in this, in this particular context. So the emphasis here on capacity is not just <coughs> capacity for a provider to engage with QQI for the first time and get past that threshold. It's really talking about the full knowledge of what this engagement requires. What will it entail? What is the life cycle of that engagement? What are the different aspects that need to be fulfilled annually and, as I say, uh, periodically? The consequences of those engagements, and, and they do have consequences, an understanding of the consequences. So when you're signing up, what are the consequences in terms of engaging, as I've just said a minute ago, perhaps in the review of effectiveness of quality assurance systems? Um, a good example would be institutional review. You're putting your institution on the open uh, public arena and you're 
allowing a peer review, for example. So there are risks associated with that from your perspective if you're an independent provider. There are also great uh, improvements and you know, very positive outcomes to that as well. But it's understanding the consequences of those engagements, both positive and also uh, your perception of the risks associated. So the capacity for sustaining engagement as a member of the education and training community, that's what we're really talking about here. What we're talking about is establishing an understanding of those engagements in, in this uh, life cycle of provider engagements. This is a life cycle of a provider. It's only an indicative one, by the way, because the more comprehensive one would look slightly different to this, but it's just an overarching view of a provider that's seeking access to QQI awards. So this is in the voluntary context. So what we're trying to do is essentially, we're proposing this model as part of our kind of concepts and principles presented in section one as a means of capturing and communicating and clarifying all the different relationships and the different contexts that we have with the different categories uh, of providers that we have. And again, so that the engagement is understood from the initial accreditation to the certification and also that the re-engagement is also understood in terms of uh, providers coming back looking for additional certification or um, higher level qualifications to be provided or are just expanding on their existing provision. This particular uh, indicative model is more for the independent um, autonomous institutions such as uh, the designat designated awarding body, the term given to universities and DIT and or, or CSI. So this is just one of the many concepts that we have presented for discussion today and again we're interested in receiving your feedback on this. As I said earlier, we've identified many issues. We've provided options. There's options in some papers, not all of them, but there are issues in all papers. So we've put these forward for your consideration and as we consider it your, your valuable feedback. Today is about communicating and allowing us to understand how you can contribute and clarifying the resources. We have a series of questions posed to try and, I suppose, to promote and stimulate the debate and to keep all of those issues in the air and, and to ensure that people are, understand the issues as they are presented, not to provide answers or policy positions because this is the idea behind consulting and seeking your feedback. So I'll hand you over to my colleague um, Trish O'Brien and Hugh and they'll explain more about the consultation process. Thank you. Thanks for that.